a community access television production of Seroptimus International of Novato. My name is Madeline Peters. Our program tonight is on Autistry Studios and our guest is Janet Lawson. Before I have Janet talk about Autistry Studios, I do want to mention that Seroptimus is an international organization that advances the status of women locally and internationally. Again, today's guest is Janet Lawson, who is, has a very interesting background. Uh, Janet is a CEO and uh, director of Autistry Studios, which is a program in San Rafael, California. Her background is in theater and film, and uh, she's a mother of an autistic son, and as a result of trying to figure out what to do about caring for her son, went back to school for a degree in counseling psychology. But she's here to talk about her program, so I'm going to turn this over to Janet. And Janet, I want to say thank you very much. I realize how hectic your schedule is. I've been to Audistry Studios and had a chance to talk with you many times. But again, thank you for taking the time. So again, why don't I have you tell a little bit about yourself and launch into um, what you do at Audistry Studios. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Madeline, for, for having me. I, Audistry Studios is a work from the heart. It was born out of my uh, private practice. I'm a therapist, uh, an MFT, and I went actually into that field because of my son. And you'd mentioned we have uh, my husband and I have an autistic son. We do. He's 17 years old. And as he was getting older, we realized that there were very, very few programs for teenagers who are on the autism spectrum, and even fewer for adults. Because this is a time when um, we have done so much research in schooling and interventions and programs for the young children, and they're fabulous. They're, some very, very good work has been done. But these young kids are now growing older, and we need to be doing more research and program development for the teenagers. So I'm looking around, and we're wondering what our son is going to do after high school, and we really didn't find anything. So I said, OK, we're going to have to start it. Well, I can imagine uh, when you're raising a child and you're seeing the nature of the schooling and services that you realize where the gaps are. And yes. which is what you and your husband were able to do. And so then what you two did is launch something <laughs> that would really kind of meet your son's needs and the needs of others. Exactly. What we did is we really listened to him and to the other kids. And it started, I began by having um, uh, ASD individuals in my private practice. So that's ASD is Autism Spectrum, autism spectrum, spectrum Disorder. And we're okay. considered the ASD community. Okay. And I began with two um, teenage girls and who are in their late teens, so launching years, just leaving high school, going into college. And I had them in my office and we we're doing regular talk therapy. And I realized this is not working. This is not, I am trying to get them to communicate with me in the very way that they have difficulty. Language is hard for those on the spectrum. Um, social interaction is difficult. So sitting in a little room trying to talk and interact with me is very difficult. And so I wasn't really connecting. So we started to do projects. So, the, the, so here you are with, you are uh, a trained therapist and yet, all of the different therapies did not fit in terms of your relationship no. with this population, which is something you recognized. Yes. And so, again, it was recognizing a need and a probably, uh, I would say, uh, a missing link within sort of the therapeutic, the model of therapeutic practice. Exactly. Okay. Because what, we're, um, what was happening is I wasn't being able to really understand where they were having problems because they weren't able to um, express that to me. And they'd see me once a week and they'd have to, one, go back and remember what had happened to them. 
Mm -hmm. And by that time, time has passed, and, and they're very event-oriented. They very much live in the now, um, our kids. So that wasn't working. So we started to, uh, for one thing, I first I brought them together because I, I was dealing with them individually. Okay. So then I brought them as a group together to work. And that was better so we could all kind of talk together. And then I realized that they really wanted to do was draw. In fact, they told me. I said, Janet, can we just draw? And I said, of course you could just draw. So I started bringing in paper and pencils and everything. And these two girls could draw. I mean, beautiful drawings. Mm -hmm. So from that, I thought, OK, this is, this is good, but I wanted to do more. And I wanted to take those 2D drawings and do three dimensions with them. I wanted to break, break their brain, is what we call it. But what, what prompted you to make that connection? Because it wanted them to see differently okay. and to work differently and to express themselves differently. And so we started taking their drawings and from their drawings making plushies, you know, making stuffed animals or stuffed figures. And then we also started doing video editing and making stories. Well, the two girls that I, um, this was going very, very well. So I added two boys to the group. So then I had four. And that was wonderful, and we started making models and different types of things, very three-dimensional things, uh, producing products, projects that you could really get your hands around. And we're, that means we were getting them out of the abstract and being very concrete. This Why is, was that important? Because concrete, uh, because abstract thinking is something that those on the spectrum often have difficulty with. Now, I don't want to generalize because some are better than others at different things. I mean, they always say if you've seen one autistic, you've seen one autistic. I see. Right? <laughs> because they're, they're so, so different. Mm -hmm. They're vastly different. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to come off and say, oh, you know, I know how to do this for everyone. I don't because each, each individual is so very different, which is why uh, we've developed a program where we listen to the kids and it's project based. So they come up with a project. But that's what you've, you're calling your therapy. You've, you've evolved or de thought about and created your particular therapeutic approach. Right. And it's called project-based therapy. The difference, um, it's also what most people would see this as milieu therapy. Okay. It's happening in the moment. Okay. It's in situ. So our workshops, um, our therapeutic workshops are four hours long. And so it's not just 50 minutes. I see. We're there four hours. Okay. We have groups that are no larger than six in a group. And that's our, that's our largest, largest, highest functioning group is six. Most are between three and, and five, three and four, I something see. like that. Um, so the groups go over a long period of time. Also, about an hour and a half into our workshops, we sit and have a large meal. And this happened organically. And this happened because I was dealing with teenagers. And you know what? Teenagers are hungry. They, all they the time. eat constantly. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized that they weren't thinking so very well because they were hungry. You know, screw the autism. This is <laughs> hunger. I've got a hungry teenager here. So I started having snacks. And, you know, I very into nutrition and we are gluten-free, dairy-free household, so I would make things. So this just came out of, again, Absolutely. it was like organically out of your realizing we need to look at making sure these kids eat yep. and then nutrition, but also my guess is socializing, socializing and, and interacting. And what happened is I was running this out of my house. Okay, I have a, a large um, barn studio b b behind our house. And so the workshop would happen in the house, and then the kids would come in and sit around my dining room table, and we would eat. And I realized they were not, snack food wasn't working, because if I gave them sugar, then about the second hour they would right. plummet. Right. And so I thought, oh, they need protein. So we started having roast chicken and pot roast and potatoes. And if you have that, you might as well have salad and bread. We have big meals. Okay, obviously. <laughs> and then... They were happy. <laughs> they were happy. They were eating. But what happened, and I did not foresee this at all, is they began to talk to each other around the dinner table just as naturally and organically as you and I would, would sit here and chat. So it's past the potatoes. How was your week? Oh, I had a terrible week. You know, whatever. <laughs> 
and they would start to talk, and I thought, this is really good. Mm -hmm. uh, about that time, so this has been going for, for a number of months, and my husband was watching all this, and he was loving it. He saw what was going on and saw how important that the, the work was becoming, and he is a fabulous model builder. I mean, he can just build anything. His background is astrophysics, so he can, you know, he's a rocket scientist. <laughs> so he can build a rocket ship or a model of a rocket ship. It doesn't mm -hmm, matter. Mm -hmm. And so he then uh, started working with us more and more and taking more and more time away from work until pretty soon he said, I want to do this. So he stepped away from his job and started working full time. So my two girls went to four two girls and two boys. I then added another four, a different group of four. So we had eight. Then there was another four. <laughs> okay, see, so we had 12. By this time, this is a lot of kids coming through the house. Sure. So when we got up to about 18 students, and then by this time I'm adding staff to, to help us, sure. um, we found a place in San Rafael that's an old warehouse and it's over 10,000 square feet and we just fell in love with it. I actually thought it was too big but my husband said no this is great mm -hmm. and he was absolutely right because we have totally grown into it. So now the projects can be larger and uh, more complex. We have more tools and our 12 students is now over 40 students. We also we had started working with uh, launching age, that late teenage, leaving high school, going into college was really the um, age range we were working with in the beginning. We then thought, you know, if we could get them younger and really work with them, that would be nice. So now um, the youngest we take is 13. So we have a lot of 13, 14, 15 year olds. And then we started getting calls from um, parents saying, you know, I have a 27-year-old at home. I have a 30-year-old at home. Would you, could you make a group for them? And we thought, well, okay, we'll do that. So we started bringing, um, we started a group for, um, for older adults. And the thing that I have learned is that the brain does not stop growing and it does not stop learning. The, the guys who are in their 30s, 40s, they're learning at a very similar rate as the 13-year-olds and the 14-year-olds. You get them interested in something, something they want to do, and they just open up and blossom and change. Well, I can also imagine you've created a setting that is ripe for that interaction, conversation, and brain development. Yes. It's just, it, what you've described to me is, you know, it's very professionally based. It's a safe place. You uh, and your family, or your, your, the, you and your husband and their staff people, as you said, you've mm -hmm. added staff, you're bringing a certain knowledge set, skill set, and professionalism. Yes. And so what, what happened to me as I'm hearing you talk about this is it, pretty soon it was word of mouth that you, where yes. you had people coming in, but then you had the setting for these people, whether they were 13 or thir in their 30s, to really begin to talk and share yes. and develop some so social skills as well as building skills. the projects that you're yes. talking about. Am I correct? Exactly. It's very multi, multi-layered and multi-nodal, you know, because one of the things we work on a lot is building the person, is identity. Um, I watched my son in uh, special ed classes all through, you know, grammar school and middle school and then into high school. And the focus and the energy is into trying to teach him things that he is not good at. And he would spend all day long trying to do things that, frankly, he will never be good at. But there are some things that my son is very good at. And what I wanted to do is say, hey, let's develop those skills. He knows about freeways. He loves trains. He can make things with his hands. He's not good at reading and taking tests and certain things, but he's also very social and funny. So he's good in film and he likes to do things and with people. So what artistry is really about is helping each individual explore their interests develop those innate talents that they have and then take them to the next step. How can we take those interests and 
make them more professional? How can we create something that we can then give to our community? How can we be viable, participating, productive citizens? So that's, and that's the function of your program. Yes. And which you've done, and I, I want you to speak to this too, is you're talking about projects, but it's like it's, that's only part of the story. It's Some the projects. kind of projects that you have going yeah. on there that the, that your um, participants are engaged in. And so please, if you could speak to Everything that. Everything from making dioramas to guitars. We have uh, several of our um, students, we call them students, are um, very musical. And so we have made now three or four um, uh, electric guitars. And these a are couple like of fully functional, full size. Oh yeah, full size yes. stringing. They play. Uh -huh. They're great. Uh, flutes, uh, dulcimers. We even made a theremin, which is a very bizarre <laughs> instrument that you move. It has to do with electromagnetism. I don't know, but it's weird, and they love it. Uh, we've also. My son is making a teardrop trailer, full size. Regular trailer. We've got guys making chairs, puppets, um, quilts. We do sewing. So we'll sew. We do fiberglass, make helmets and costumes. Whatever, whatever the individual is, we will try to make. And the interesting part here is that myself, my husband, and our staff, we're all quite talented in, in our various ways. We have different skills. But what's really fun is when the kids want to do something that we don't know how to do. I see. So we yeah. all learn together. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because then they get to see us learning. And so they get to learn how to learn. Right, right. They learn how to learn and they have to learn how to teach. Yes. Uh -huh. And exactly. And uh -huh. then we have them help each other. And it's a very, very, very supportive atmosphere. But see, your description right now, I have a new understanding of you, of the work that's going on in, in your studio. And that is, uh, it's obviously serving a need, but it's also becoming its own sort of world. Yes. And I don't mean world in a closed sense, because you've got your students producing these sort of very important, significant items that can extend to um, out, outside of the studio, outside of outside of themselves, outside of the studio, so you're create you've created an environment or a culture there, but with the connection to, as you I think you had said too, something outside of themselves yeah. or bigger than themselves, themselves by virtue of what they're making. Exactly, and the next step in this process is um, what where we're at right now, which is very very exciting to me because it was part of the original vision. We've been calling what we do pre-vocational therapeutic workshops, which is a mouthful. Uh, then we realized that some of our um, students have been with us for years. So how long can you be pre-vocational? I see, yeah. <laughs> At a certain point, you've got to make that transition. Yeah, you've got to make that transition. <laughs> and we're all about growing and changing. So um, our next thing is vocational. So we got a wonderful grant from the Bothine Foundation. And they gave us a grant to purchase very expensive equipment. The first piece we uh, purchased came last week, and it is a robotic router. It's called a ShopBot. And you program it, and it's like a CAD system, a computer-aided design system that you program it. And it will um, then cut out the design the, from, from a piece of, of plywood, a regular 8 by, what is it? six by eight sheet of plywood uh, and you feed the plywood in and it does it. It does, right. It does it. So say the kids have made one clock. We've been doing lots of clocks that are beautiful. <laughs> and uh, we say, okay, so now we have the design for the clock. Now they can make 20 of them. They can make a hundred of them, mm -hmm. okay? And the idea is that they will take their concepts, go through the whole production process to the end product and then the next step then is to take it to the market and sell it. Because I want them to have that experience of going from concept all the way through production to consumer, to their customer. Well, you've had, uh, it's like, so it seems as though you're ramping up this aspect yep. of it with the grant, with the access to different yep. equipment, and with the kind of projects. 
uh, it seems like there's some stories. I think there's one st the one story that I know of, if you could speak to uh, Owen's story. Owen oh, Brett. Uh, because I, I thought that was really an amazing story. Owen, um, Owen's going to come in and you can do an interview with I Owen <laughs> himself. Uh, Owen is a lovely, lovely young man who's in his mid-30s. And he came to us. He uh, loves to draw. And he's a fabulous um, artist. And he had all these stories that he would develop with his dad. Um, so we worked with Susie Musgrove, who um, has her shop. She's a graphic designer, and she partners with Artistry. And she uh, worked with Owen, helping him take his drawings to a real professional level, using InDesign and other um, you know, professional software. And he has now created three books. Um, there's Eunice the Unicorn, Contanga the Cat, Birthday Surprise, and now several, uh, he has a book in progress, Victor, and also a comic book that he's drawing. So he has taken his art and really made it professional. And we've had them professionally um, bound and printed, and they're just gorgeous. And this is what we want for each of our, uh, of our individuals, to take their talents, take their skills, really hone them professionally. Not as, oh, isn't it cute that they can do that, but hey, this guy's got talent. Well, what, Owen had a signing. In a, in a book yes, we got him a signing at Book Passage, uh -huh. and the Book Passage was lovely. They hosted Owen with all their other um, national book award winning authors. See, and I was very proud of him. But that really shows the extent. To me, that's yeah. the, the little story that represents what I yes. see you doing on now, kind of moving yes. on a large scale. Yeah. But that here Owen was able to have his own book signing yeah. at a, a local, very popular, very uh, well known, well -known very prestigious well place. Yes. Right, right. So he, that was his yeah. socialization into a world outside of himself, yes. outside of artistry and a connection to the community. And where he, the other part of what we're doing is identity building. Now here is Owen goes out into the community, has a signing at Book Passage. He's not Owen, an autistic young man. He's Owen, an author. He's Owen, a, a, an animator, because he also loves to do animation. And this is what I want for them. So you're changing the perception yes. that your students have of themselves, and you're also changing the perception of the community yes. in terms of who these people are and what they can do. It's exactly okay. what we're doing. Exactly. Okay. Because as they, um, so, so often we have low expectation right. for our um, special needs community. And we're going, no, we raise the bar. Our program is difficult and it's challenging. It's not easy for them. They have to really work hard and challenge themselves and take risks. And we're right there with them. And we said, we're, we're taking risks too. I don't know how to do fiberglass, but here I am and gloved up and I'm doing it. You know, you can too. So when's the documentary of your, <laughs> of Audistry coming out? I mean, that's, that's, you definitely need to tell your bigger story. One. Yes. You and I can talk about this and that's one aspect of it. But th what you're describing to me is, is multi-dimensional, multi-layered and really as you said, with your project-based therapy, that's a new way of thinking and organizing. Yes. Very new. I'm not exactly sure how many other places are uh, following your pattern. Well, the word is starting to get out, and we're getting more and more um, inquiries from all over. And when you say all over, where do you mean? Well, you know, from, from England. I've gotten calls from Australia. I've got a lot of calls from the, from so you're around the States and Canada. An international, there's yes. an international awareness of what's yeah. going on yes. in this warehouse yeah. in yeah. San Rafael, California. And, and it's very, very exciting. And this next step of actually manufacturing, um, I, I can see I can see lots of really incredible possibilities, one of which is that we could make um, kits that other programs could put together. Because not everybody has a table saw and a band right. saw and all of the incredible saws that we have. So what if we made kits and then other programs, those individuals could assemble them and paint them and they will have made something. Phenomenal. So uh, well, is there a way that you can speak to 
the next steps, the future, and then we're, we're about ready to kind of wrap up the show. So, mm-hmm. but I'd like to you to comment on the things that you feel are important and talk about the fair and things along those lines. <laughs> so, if you can kind of wrap all wrap of that, all up. that up, okay. What to me, what's really important is that we stay together as a community, and I mean that as a community as a whole, and that we really um, help our special needs individuals find a place where they can be productive, where we're not just always taking care of and pampering and, and, and keeping them safe. As a mother, my instinct is to keep my son safe at all costs, but I also know he's got to take risks. I believe in the dignity of risk. I believe it's important to have faith in somebody's ability to fall down and stand up again. And that's what I, that's what I say to people about our special needs population, whether they're physically um, disabled or whether they have um, cognitive impairments of one sort or another, is let them try. But you've also provided a context yes. that's very professional yes. and safe. So it's like the, your students can take risks yes. and their caregivers, parents or other people understand that they are t- taking risks but they're in an environment of professional professionals yes. that cr- is tr- to, trying to encourage and develop the professionalism of I think you always need a safe space to, to take risk. You mm-hmm. really do. I mean, it, you know, I'm not saying jump off a cliff, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying push yourself a little further right. and go. And the other thing we do, uh, Madeline, which I think is very important, is we deal with the whole family. We bring in the whole family to talk and and um, develop because you need the whole family support. Of course, of course. Well, there's a lot more that you and I need to talk about, but that's <laughs> going to have to wait until another time. Uh, thank you very much, Janet, for spending time with me tonight to talk about Autistry Studios and and join us at our at our Autistry Fair yes, on October twenty eighth. Absolutely, see our I, projects. I, I I will, and I hope that we can begin to uh, have further conversations and further programs. Uh, I would like to close by thanking Seroptimus International of Novato for. Uh, being the crew, the volunteer talent in front and behind the camera, and also Novato Public Access Television. This is Madeline Peters. I just served as the interviewer to, uh, in a discussion of Autistry Studios with Janet Lawson, the executive director and CEO of Autistry Studios. Thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>